30 minutes, 45 minutes an hour, really sort of free. And we'll play and, the video, and see where it goes. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, it is my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Uh, Norbert Gleischer uh, today. And we're going to be talking about um, reproductive medicine and 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 supplements in particular the value of DHEA and 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 how we can learn more about it its use uh in in fertility and in other healthy areas potentially um and Dr. Gleischer has an extensive bio uh, I think the simple part of it is he's the chief scientist and medical director at the Center for Human Reproduction in New York and we'll make sure that we can give some links uh and and um contacts that you could find him and we'll also list uh, his bio with with over 400 uh, publications and many more things I've always highly respected Dr. Gleischer and been uh, very impressed by his knowledge and expertise and always willing to share with people uh, Dr. Gleischer thank you for being uh, here today really appreciate you, you stopping in my pleasure Anytime. well maybe we could start off a little bit um, uh, how you how you got into reproductive medicine, and uh, I know you're from uh, Vienna, Austria. Is that correct? And how you got to New York? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I got uh, into reproductive medicine uh, by by accident, uh, just as I got into medical school by accident, and just as I got into OBGYN as a specialty by accident. And it taught me in life of that we can plan for all the unimportant little stuff, but the important things just seem to happen. Um, I got into reproductive medicine, even though uh, my academic career started really in high-risk OB, uh, mostly medical complications of pregnancy. Uh, and my, my research work, my laboratory, uh, which I established already when I was a resident at Mount Sinai here in New York City, was in reproductive immunology. Um, and uh, in those early days, um, infertility was really, it existed, but it was kind of the joke of the specialty. Mm. Uh, residents usually didn't want to go into infertility because it wasn't serious. And then IVF happened, and that changed it all. And uh, I, shortly after IVF happened, um, was recruited to Chicago as a very young department chair into a teaching hospital into Mount Sinai, Chicago. Uh, and I was in the middle of an inner city hospital that had to compete uh, with some of the big boys like Northwestern, like Michael Reese in those days, like the University of Chicago, University of Illinois, right next door. And uh, here I was a young department chair, and how would I do that? And the idea was, let's start the first IVF program in Chicago, actually in the whole Midwest. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those days, you couldn't hire people to run something new because there were no experts. You know, mm -hmm. at the time, maybe half a dozen IVF centers existed in all of the U.S. and everybody stood in line in Norfolk to get trained. And so I sent uh, my head of the RE division to Sweden because he was Swedish and Lars Hamburger there had a, uh, an early well-running IVF program. And I sent myself to Paris uh, because Rene Friedman had a, had a well-running program retrieving laparoscopically in those days while the patient was awake and opera music was playing in the operating room. And both Jan Fried uh, Burke, who was my RE chief, and I spent two weeks in those places and came back as experts. And uh, we started the first IVF program. Amazing. 
Uh, it took us four hours to find our first egg because the the embryologist or the PhD who, who was the embryologist uh, was really an immunologist with whom I had worked for many years in my immunology lab. Yeah, so that was the beginning. And uh, the idea was initially that I would get the IVF program going and then return to what I was doing, which was my love for uh, medical problems in pregnancy and the sicker the patients were, the more I enjoyed it. And I did it together for about three years. And then it got too much and I had to make a decision. And I made the decision to stay on the infertility side with IVF. And uh, the rest is history, so. And, and you've been in New York for how long at the uh, at uh, Center for Human Reproduction? And so I, I, I started out in New York. I did my residency at Sinai. I was two years full-time faculty at Sinai before I was recruited to Sinai. And I was in Chicago 10 years in my position as department chair. And then I left and uh, built a, a private uh, program uh, in in the city that very quickly became actually one of the biggest programs in those country. Uh, and then in 2002, I moved full-time back to New York. At that point, we had also a center in New York and in Chicago for about five years. I commuted in between, between the two, spent half a week here, half a week there. That got too crazy sold the Chicago operations and I'm since 2003, I'm full-time back in New York. Well, we, we're going to get some questions here today and really excited to, to be able to answer these uh, with, with your expertise, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, supplements and, and, and DHEA and how you sort of came to, to focus on these things. It's something that, that may help uh, people's uh, reproductive uh, women's reproduction. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I had uh, no interest in supplements, to be very honest. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't, up to, to this date, I wouldn't describe myself uh, as a particular fan of supplements. Uh, and in a way, DHEA is really not a supplement because in the rest of the world, DHEA is considered the hormone and uh, actually in many countries considered a controlled substance because it is widely abused in sports and in bodybuilding and in, in other things. It's only in the US that DHEA is considered a supplement. Now, I learned about supplement from a patient. Hmm. as so many times. And it was a, we call her here our index patient. Uh, she was a 42-year-old, very smart, very intelligent, single woman, banker and lawyer. Dangerous combination. <laughs> um, who walked in one day and wanted to freeze her eggs. And... I said to her, you're a little bit too old for egg freezing. Now she insisted on freezing. She was not ready to get pregnant. Uh, she insisted on freezing. So I said, okay, uh, one cycle. And we did a retrieval and we got one egg and one embryo. And we had again a conversation actually in the office in which I'm sitting right now. And I said to her, that's it. And she, she literally begged on her knees for a second chance. So I said, okay, one more, but that is it. Absolutely. And uh, the second cycle, a month later, she produced three eggs and three beautiful embryos. Mm. How could I refuse more, more freezing cycles? Uh, 
And so it went month after month. And in every month, she produced more eggs and more embryos. Until after, I think it was her sixth cycle, one day she walks into my office smiling and says, Dr. Gleicher, really, I have to tell you a little secret. And by that time, we were obviously scratching our hair. What is going on with this woman? She, in the meanwhile, was 43 already. Every cycle, she gives us more eggs and more embryos. And the secret was that she read an article about DHEA from colleagues in Texas who did a small case series. And she started taking DHEA. And she read actually a few other papers that claimed uh, various drugs uh, that might improve egg and embryo numbers. But she chose, chose DHEA because it was the only thing that didn't require a prescription and she could take without telling me. And by that time, she had really polycystic ovaries. Hmm. Hmm. And that was to us uh, really the beginning of a long story of, um, of research and, and uh, development. And I have to acknowledge in the beginning, we had absolutely no idea why DHA was working. It was only a few years later when some colleagues elsewhere in, in, in a mouse uh, model uh, worked it all out and, and explained how androgens work in, in the ovary that we started to understand. But the interesting thing was by that point that we, from our clinical observations, had reached certain conclusions that we now saw confirmed in the mouse. And because we started collaborating with that group, we kind of had the ability of going between mouse and human and uh, look at in the human at what was seen in the mouse and test out in the mouse what we saw in the human. So uh, that's a story. Uh, and, we probably published 40 papers plus on, on DHEAs over the years. Uh, and it has become a widely used treatment uh, all over the world. So who do you think, who, who should, who benefits the most from the use of, of a supplement like DHEA, do you think? And how do the patients know whether or not they should be looking at this? This is a very good question. <laughs> for no other reason, for example, uh, for what happened today with a new patient. Uh, I got a call today from a 35-year-old woman uh, who wants to freeze her eggs uh, on the West Coast in Seattle. And uh, somebody, a doctor, uh, they recommended to her that she start taking DHEA before she does it because she's getting older. And she started reading and she read that the dosage is, uh, they recommended dose, starting dose is 25 milligrams three times a day. And she started doing that. And then six weeks later, her doctor for the first time tested her androgen levels and she had sky high androgen levels, uh, sky high testosterone and sky high DHEAS. And she called all upset that she thought she ruined her ovaries already by, by doing that. Uh, but the, the, the joke in this is obviously that the 35-year-old who has no infertility history doesn't need any DHEA. And if you give her DHEA, she will uh, become hyperandrogenic uh, because that's what happens when you take something uh, that you don't need. And I think that is... Uh, that is the answer to your question. Uh, androgens are of crucial importance for normal ovarian function. So if a woman has normal androgen levels, 
whatever her age, she doesn't need the chair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the same is true. Whatever her age, she does need uh, androgen supplementation if her androgen levels are low. Now, we don't prescribe DHEA uh, unless we see that a, a woman has low androgen levels. And, and is the what, finding, I'm sorry, is the finding of lower ovarian reserve an important component along with the low DHEA, or is it just the low DHEA matters? Well, the truth is, and we published that uh, quite a number of years ago, that one of the characteristics of almost every woman, I can say that is a 99% finding in women with low functional ovarian reserve, whether they are young and suffer from premature ovarian aging or whether they are older, over age 40, and suffer from physiological ovarian aging. They are all hypoandrogenic. In other words, Low functional ovarian reserve is accompanied also by low androgens. And mm -hmm. therefore, the vast majority will need androgen supplementation, but not everyone. Once in a while, you will find a 45-year-old woman who has normal androgens. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, the, it's sort of the supplements the world of supplements for, for everything. And it's just, we're, we're, we're over utilizing them potentially or, or where we don't need them, but as a supplement, but it's really a controlled substance. So unlike maybe extra vitamin D or vitamin C can extra DHEA when you haven't properly been uh, uh, tested be harmful. Uh, Yes, but fortunately only to a very minor degree at the dosages that we use. And that is very important because when you look at the dosages that are taken in abuse, etc., they take 10 times the dosages sometimes that, that we prescribe. Hmm. At the dosages that we use, there is very little harm. The, the side effects that that uh, we see are oily skin, uh, acne, really, rarely hair loss, really nothing beyond that. And there's a reason for that, because DHEA has very low affinity to the androgen receptor. And so even if your DHEA levels are marginally high, let's say over 350, no big deal because mm -hmm. it doesn't do very much. Uh, what does damage if it is too high is testosterone because that is obviously the, the active androgen. And... And uh, a lot of colleagues use testosterone rather than DHEA to supplement. We don't like it because when you give testosterone directly, you're flooding the body of the patient. And therefore, it's very easy, it's very easy to overdose. Hmm. And too much testosterone, I don't have to tell you that, is probably worse than too little testosterone. And uh, so we don't like to supplement with testosterone. We only supplement with testosterone in rare cases where women are resistant to DHA. And there are some cases to the, like that. Well, let's see. Let me get a couple of questions, if I may. We to, uh, Oni says hello to both of us. Mm -hmm. uh, you, Zoe. Uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob McKinney, uh, can you take DHA if you're on thyroid medication, uh, she reads that I shouldn't take it if you have a thyroid problem. Can yeah. you comment about that? No, the, the, there's no reason not to take uh, DHA with a thyroid problem. And actually, thyroid problems usually means that you have a hyperactive immune system, and hyperactive immune systems in turn are very closely associated with early ovarian aging and, and low functional ovarian reserves. So a lot of patients with low androgens will have hypothyroidism. And, and I know you have a particular expertise in immunology. 
uh, any link between uh, the diminished ovarian function and potentially even thyroid dysfunction in, yeah. in immunology, do you think? Yeah, uh, I don't only think so. I am, I am very convinced, even though uh, 40 years of research uh, looking for an epitope on ovaries uh, that stimulates the immune system to attack have failed. Uh, there is only one condition that that produces such an epitope and that is very rea rare and and occurs uh, only in women who have also Addison's disease uh, and that is uh, autoimmune ophoritis and that is an exceedingly rare condition otherwise nobody has ever found anything against which the immune system works um, in uh, in the ovary uh, we have certain theories about why that is um, but uh, your your question the, or the answer to your question is a very clear yes uh, indeed uh, when you look at what are the main associated uh, phenotypes in women who for example develop a premature ovarian failure or primary ovarian insufficiency or the milder form premature ovarian aging, uh, in all of them, autoimmunity is the number one. You will find a very high incidence of, of autoimmunity. Yeah, that switches. I, I, I look um, and, and believe that things like hyperglycemia, which damages the microvascular system, ultimately damages the, the ovarian vascular system, which may affect blood flow and may damage the, the, the uh, granulosa, the, the, the um, oocytes. Look, everything is possible. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are many good reasons why 10% of all women prematurely age their ovaries. 10% is a huge number. And that is a finding that you find in every racial group, and it's a finding that you find in every ethnic group. 10% of women age their ovaries prematurely. There must be more than one, one good reason for, for, for such a prevalence. Well, I, I, I know you uh, focus a lot on, on reproductive immunology, but it's, it, finding the right answer is not always so simple in medicine. And there's so many uh, disagreements to find that one thing, but I because think we it, all need to be... Because it really is only one thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, uh, our, our health system is fortunately built like a rocket to the moon, you have to have redundancies over redundancies over redundancies, because otherwise we all wouldn't be here. Imagine if a little thing that doesn't work right could prevent a pregnancy. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. Well, and, and ultimately, uh, like DHEA, it, it wasn't something that we all thought about it. It's something that uh, a, a patient brought to the, the, the table and, and shared something that we opened up to the possibilities of something as simple as this could, could help. I always say the most I have ever learned is from what I learned from patients. Yes. It's, uh, there's no question about it. Uh, all, all important ideas in one way or the other came from patients. We need to listen. Uh, Laura Schmidt asked a question and, and uh, with a slightly high DHEA as uh, and I still take DHA. I do have mild PCOS. Mm -hmm. I guess the question is, could could the DHA sort of bring on a PCOS-like syndrome? Absolutely. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, our index patient, our first patient, she at age 43 developed an ovarian PCOS phenotype. So the answer is yes, in terms of how your ovaries will look. 
if you're exposed to DHA for too long, and uh, we also know this now from from trans uh, women uh, who, in their transition to male, uh, take high dosages of DHA, they all develop PCOS phenotype ovaries. Do you have a theory on on why they develop that that uh, phenotype of of uh, polycystic ovaries? What the mechanism might be? Well, it's again, it is it it it's a complicated answer, um, and and I need to again tell you here a little story. Uh, Fifty percent of a woman's androgens, roughly, come from her ovary. The other 50% come from her adrenals, from the zona reticularis in her adrenals. Now, we have known that for decades, and we used it in the old days when, when I studied for my boards. Uh, when a patient had PCOS, whether she had adrenal PCOS or she had ovarian PCOS, which right. in health is a crazy concept, but anyway. Uh, the same applies also the other way around. Uh, in, in, in other words, if a woman has low androgens, uh, the deficiency may come from the ovaries or the deficiency may come from the adrenals. And um, if it's in the ovaries, it's obviously the theca because the theca produces the androgens. If it's from the adrenals, it's in the reticularis. Uh, and if the deficiency is ovarian, then you can give that patient all the DHA and all the testosterone you want, and you will not get any benefits for her fertility because if the theca doesn't work, it means the ovary is burned out all, all your supply, all your support will not, not help them. <coughs> In other words, the patients who respond to androgen supplementation, whether DHA or testosterone directly, are women who have adrenal androgen insufficiency. When you then supplement, the ovaries suddenly revive because they were suffering from lack of androgens and now they are getting androgens. Okay, so that is a very important point in understanding uh, who benefits and, and, and why they do. But this is also very important for another reason. And that brings me back to the PCOS issue. We believe that uh, PCOS, as we still see it after 40 years of Rotterdam criteria, that PCOS is a hyperandrogenic condition. Mm -hmm. And that is in principle true. All the various, all the four phenotypes, when they are young after menarche, are hyperandrogenic. But the most overlooked phenotype is the phenotype D, which in the literature is generally ignored. I tried to, I did a literature search once. I found one paper about phenotype D and about 500 million papers about phenotype A. Uh, phenotype D is also called the lean phenotype. And <clears throat> under the Rotterdam criteria, it's usually described as the normal ovulatory phenotype and the lean phenotype. But what is not described in the literature and what we only discovered about seven or eight years ago is that it is also the only phenotype who changes its androgen levels. While these women start with high androgens like the other phenotypes, roughly at age 25, their androgen start declining. And it is the adrenal portion that starts mm -hmm. declining, likely an autoimmune condition, not proven yet, but likely. 
they are for 10 years, so roughly between age 25 and 35, they are in normal range. And therefore, when you look into the literature, they are normal androgenic described because most PCOS diagnoses are being reached between ages 25 and 35 when they are in that normal range. But when you see then these patients after age 35, they come out on the other side of the normal range and suddenly they are hypoandrogenic. And that is, in my opinion, the most often overlooked diagnosis in infertility. Uh, we see them almost daily. Uh, because here you have those completely normal looking women that don't look like PCOS women. They have normal periods uh, and they don't get pregnant and they don't get pregnant with, with IVF either. And they don't get pregnant because they have exceedingly low androgens after, only after age 35. If, you, if they try getting pregnant before that, they have no problem getting pregnant. But nowadays that old women are trying to get pregnant only so late in life, suddenly this is becoming a big issue. So, because I hear so many women that claim they've had a history of PCOS, but their AMH doesn't speak that, no, their ultrasound. So I'm wondering, it's a little bit of the burnout. Yeah, and so, so if they have a history of PCOS, uh, and you see them after age 35, I'm ready to bet that for a 35-year-old, they still have very good AMH levels. But if you test your androgens, you will find that they are all in the cellar. And if you give them DHEA, their ovaries revive, and they suddenly have normal pregnancy rates. I'm mentioning this because you asked about PCOS and uh, you know, it's another topic that we have been doing a lot of work on in recent years. And we are very, very convinced that uh, much of our thinking about PCOS is simply not true. And we increasingly believe that what we call PCOS are really two very, very distinct uh, condition. One is the traditional PCOS, that we all know how it looks with obesity, acne, hirsutism, anovulation, etc. A metabolic syndrome later in life, that is clearly one, one very clear condition. But there's the second PCOS of this lean PCOS women. They don't get metabolic syndrome. But, and that brings me back to immunology, they have, in 85% of cases, evidence for hyperactive immune system. And you see them frequently as repeat aborters. You see when they are younger and when they are still getting pregnant. And they have a very, very clearly an immune problem. But I think that is explaining why we never found an epitope against which the, the immune system works in, in women with infertility and autoimmunity because the autoimmunity is probably an anti-adrenal autoimmunity. It is mm. not an anti-ovarian autoimmunity. We have looked at, at, at the wrong organ. And that should not surprise because a lot of people don't know that, but adrenals and ovaries uh, have, a, have a common primordium embryologically. You know, they came from the same organ. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it, it, it shouldn't surprise if, if there's more connection between the adrenals and the ovaries than we currently are aware of. Uh, and I think there's much more there that we still have to figure out. To give you another another good example for for that argument, AMH receptors, which are in the highest concentration, obviously in ovaries. But but you know what the second organ is where the second highest concentration of AMH receptors are, the adrenal glands. Yet 
nobody has in the literature yet described the function for AMH in the adrenals. So, or is it just they since they came from the same uh, cell line? Yeah, might might be might be an underlying reason, but evolution would have eliminated those those receptors over those millions of years if they had not a function that we still need to figure out. Well, so Laura Schmidt, she had mentioned her age thirty eight AMH of three point five. With with a uh, DHEA of three hundred six, she also mentioned she does have mild PCOS, but has a history of recurrent pregnancy loss. Do we so, tend to see a lot more pregnancy loss in women with a history of PCOS, whether it's clinically identified at their age of that we're seeing them? Uh, in, in what is considered to be the phenotype D, absolutely yes. Whether you see also increased uh, miscarriages in, in the other phenotypes, I'm not sure, certainly not to the degree you see in phenotype D. And so if this, uh, this uh, lady who you just quoted uh, is skinny, if she has a lean BMI, her AMH, uh, I cannot judge because I don't know how old she is, but... Uh, 38, 38, 3.5. So AMH of 3.5 is a pretty, pretty excellent AMH. Yeah. So yeah. I, I would bet that she is a phenotype D PCOS patient. She should check her androgens. So, so I want to talk a little bit more about DHEA. Mm -hmm. And and what's the best way to identify uh, who should uh, be prescribed DHEA, uh, and at what dose, and how do you follow that patient on with DHEA? Yeah, and so all good questions. Uh, as I already said, a patient should be supplemented with androgens with DHEA only if her androgens are low. What does that mean? Uh, that is an age-dependent judgment because younger people have higher androgen levels than obviously older, older patients. Uh, and uh, we, uh, as I also already stated, we do not put patients on DHA anymore for many years unless we know they are hypoandrogenic. Now, how do you know that somebody is hypoandrogenic? Obviously, first of all, by, by the levels. And I would say if you have a young woman, because androgen levels are pretty tricky because different laboratories have different levels and different methodologies of testing will give you different results. And so what we tell our colleagues or what I tell colleagues when I'm talking about the subject is always, Look at the range of the laboratory. If the patient is in the lower third of that range, worry, particularly if it's a, if it's a younger person. But then you have a tool that can help you determine whether she is hypoandrogenic or not. And that is SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, because that goes into the opposite direction. If your patient has low androgens, her sex hormone binding globulin will be high. And the lower her androgens are, the higher will be her SHPG. And so if her SHPG is over 80, again, she is probably close to being low or already low. And if she's over 100, she is definitely low in her androgens. And so based on that, we decide to supplement or not to supplement. And obviously how low they are depends on how, how much we supplement. Now we routinely use to supplement 25 milligrams three times a day, not because we ever tested it out, mm -hmm. but because that's what our index patient took. And because she took it, that was how, how we did our studies. Uh, and we never, 
never changed it because we never saw a reason to change it. Because mm -hmm. what we quickly learned is that um, once a patient reaches a, a, a certain level, if she doesn't change the dosage or the product she's taking, she will maintain those levels. Huh? At least that's what we used to believe until about a year and a half or two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, if it, it almost never happened until two years ago that we started somebody on 25 milligrams three times a day and we had to reduce the dosage because her DHA and DHAS went too high or her testosterone went too high. Almost never, maybe one or two cases a year. Then something happened about two years ago. We started seeing more and more cases where women on this standard dosage got into too high ranges. And we saw it with with several different DHAA products. So not only with one product where you could assume maybe they changed their, their production line or whatever. And it simply seems that uh, all DHAA that comes into the US comes from China and most comes from only one factory. Hmm. And so it simply seems that the DHA that is coming out of China over the last two years or so may be more potent. Hmm. And so over the last two years, uh, basically with uh, COVID, we started watching our patients much closer. And actually we have a paper in press in, in FNS um, where we are where we are advising on, on this uh, because we now constantly have to step down patients. Never used mm -hmm. to happen. But we now, over the last uh, few years, have to step down patients. And so we are regularly monitoring your androgens much more frequently than, than we used to. Tell us a little bit about the source uh, and quality, because I know you've talked a lot about that in in your in your papers. Can you talk to our our uh, viewers about that? Yeah. So so uh, there are huge differences in DHA quality, and not only in DHA quality. That is a characteristic of all supplements. If if you look mm -hmm. into the literature. Uh, huge differences in quantity, uh, huge difference in quality. And with DHEA, uh, there's also something that is called micronizing, meaning what are the particle sizes that are in the, in the pills or in the capsules. And depending on that particle size, uh, the DHEA will have different absorption qualities. And when we started our studies on DHEA, uh, we had a pharmacy down the block from us, uh, Metro, compound DHEA for our patients. Uh, that got very expensive, as you can imagine, for the patient. And, and uh, therefore, we got interested and we tried to convince all, the, all of our friends in, in, in the big man of fertility manufacturers uh, to, to start producing a DHA product. We couldn't get anybody interested. And so we started uh, uh, looking for somebody who would make it for us under the same size of micronization exactly as we had published because that's what we, we, we felt we, we had to offer. And we started looking for who could supply it. And that's when we discovered that everything came from China. Mm. And uh, I mean, whoever, whoever uh, supplies uh, different manufacturers, and there are lots of manufacturers who will produce it for you all over the country. But, uh, but 
they all are depending on raw material supplies from elsewhere. And most of those come from China and from India. And with DHA, everything seems to come from China. You have uh, many years of expertise in this particular area. And, and, and your opinion is, I think, very valuable to those women suffering uh, from diminished ovarian reserve. Um, what would be your sort of simple advice to those that are thinking they should uh, take a DHA to improve their fertility? Um, again, I, I have written about that many times. I consider DHA not to be a supplement. I consider DHA to be a drug like many other drugs we are prescribing, and therefore we have always maintained to our patients that they should not take DHEA uh, on their own. Um, the, the, the problem is, and this case from today I, I mentioned before is a good example, that unfortunately many colleagues who prescribe DHEA uh, really uh, do not understand. I think we lost it. I'm here. Sorry about that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sorry. Many, uh, many of our colleagues who prescribe DHEA and use DHEA uh, do not fully understand how DHEA works or how androgens in general work. And and therefore, uh, you know, maybe they don't even believe that it does work. And uh, I hear very frequently that patients ask for DHA and the doctor says, oh, you know, we don't believe it, but if you want, take it. Mm -hmm. I think that is the worst, the worst of all scenarios uh, because uh, either take it right or don't take it at all. It kind of doesn't make any sense to, 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 to be somewhere in between. And that is what's unfortunately happening to too many patients. Um, DHEA, uh, like, and, and again, testosterone basically does the same thing. It works at a certain time period of follicle development. And that time period is called the small growing stages. Mm -hmm. Those are the early stages after resting follicles are recruited into maturation. And it is those first few weeks where those follicles really need good androgen levels. And androgens, uh, testosterone, works together with FSH and something that is called IGF-1 at those stages to help follicles grow mature and grow in size. But the follicles who get this benefit still need at least six to eight weeks before they are big enough to be in, in a stage which is called the gonadotropin sensitive stage where they respond to the fertility drugs we give them in an IVF cycle. And therefore, if you don't treat them with androgens for at least six to eight weeks before you start them in an IVF cycle, you're not gonna treat the follicles that you're gonna get in your immediate IVF cycle. You're gonna treat the follicles in the next months or the months afterwards. Uh, and so you really need to understand how to prescribe uh, DHEA. And, and it, it is very important uh, that, that our colleagues really understand why, why we are using it. Uh, there is a lot of skepticism about DHEA still amongst many colleagues mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or about androgens. And I understand it because there are no good prospectively randomized studies. But in contrast to many other uh, what I call BS stuff that is going on in our field, the androgen question has been worked out in animal models beyond, beyond any discussion. I mean, uh, 
we now know how androgens work. And therefore the argument that I don't believe that women need good androgens uh, doesn't make sense anymore. Hmm. And sometimes uh, I would argue in the majority of what we do in medicine, we we are getting our evidence not from prospectively randomized studies, but from uh, lesser evidence. And I wish we had as good evidence as we have about the importance of androgens uh, over many other things that we're doing in IVF. We don't. Yet, uh, everybody's doing those other things without any criticism, but uh, are, you know, upset about using uh, androgens. It's, it's kind of a little bizarre, but hmm. that's what medicine is. It, it, it is, and, and we're throwing so many things, and, and fertility, uh, the, the list is, is infinite of the things people are, are trying. Uh, for, for a patient who we find that they have evidence of diminished ovarian reserve, AMH, less than one, less than 1.5. I guess it may be determined on their age. It may be a comment on that. How long after they started do you recommend checking uh, uh, DHEA levels and or evidence of benefit like an AMH, or is it yeah. necessary? Yeah. So uh, we our protocol is we start them on DHEA and we retest them after four weeks. And usually everybody is in range after four weeks. Uh, and then if they are in range, uh, we will retest them between three and six months later again. And uh, H, H uh, is indeed a crucially important issue in AMH. Uh, one is uh, an AMH of one means something very different in a 30-year-old than in a 40-year-old. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you have to look at age specific, specific curves. We published them uh, many, many years ago. Since then, other people have published much better, larger number of curves. So those are available. They are easily accessible. Uh, and I can only recommend to everybody to, to stop looking at absolute values for both FSH and AMH and look at age specific values for both of those. And, and in your, your uh, first patient years ago where she was using DHEA, you probably weren't measuring her AMH and following that, but you were watching her improvement in her response. Yeah, her response, as I said, she, from cycle to cycle, she produced more eggs and more embryos. And we, after a six or seven cycle, I don't remember now, we actually had to step down her stimulation because she overstimulated. She hyperstimulated. Hmm. Hmm. So, so if you're not seeing a benefit in in uh, the DHEA. Uh, and as measured, I imagine, by either pregnancy or uh, follicular development, egg quality, quantity, uh, do you stop it or do you just keep it on? And uh, how would you manage that patient? Well, that is a very complex question because, first of all, um, if you give DHEA, the first question, if you don't get the response is, are you just clinically not getting a response or are you not getting a response in terms of androgen levels? Hmm. Because as I mentioned before, there is something like DHA resistance. Uh, and in those patients, uh, we, and those patients are rare, but, but if you, you have a big enough patient volume, you will once in a while see one. In those patients, we switch to uh, testosterone gel. And that usually gets their, their testosterone up. Now, if it's a functional insufficiency, which means that you do not see an improvement uh, in either AMH and or clinical response from your, from your DHEA, uh, 
there is really no purpose uh, keeping keeping them on it. But but then it is time to look at uh, at, at other possible things. I mean, uh, I give you an, an an example. I also mentioned that already. Another very important factor in follicle growth at those same early growing stages is IGF one. And IGF-1 is the biological active uh, substance of human growth hormone. And now we are not uh, we are not a center that uses human growth hormone uh, routinely, um, but we use human growth hormone selectively when patients have low IGF-1. And the rationale is exactly the same as it is with androgen. Uh, there's no logic in using human growth hormone if the patient has normal IGF-1. And therefore, we also test uh, patients for the IGF-1 levels. And if we see that the DHEA is not doing anything, uh, sometimes what we find is that they have low IGF-1 levels and we add human growth hormone. And if that doesn't work, then we really get into experiment, or what we consider experimental treatments. And uh, you know, we have four, we have three clinical trials running on a PFP currently for different patient populations. Um, so we may do PFP on the patient, um, uh, and and that's it. And that's mm -hmm. Point, even our patients may have to consider donor eggs. And that's something that, that uh, everyone should consider depending on, on, on their clinical uh, situation. Uh, a couple of quick questions, if I may, that some of our patients are, are bringing. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see, Victoria Rudd. I think we may have gotten to part of this, but symptomatically, I think she was noticing maybe uh, at 75 milligrams a day, she had acne and greasy skin, but when she cut back to 20, or, or I do wonder though, if 25 milligrams is too little. So if she cuts back and doesn't have the symptoms, is that enough to really know the dosage, the proper dosage, or should she be looking at the levels more than anything? She needs to have levels. And the, the symptoms can happen with 25 milligrams or with 75 milligrams. There are just some patients who are more sensitive in their skin. Uh, others are more sensitive in their hair follicles. Uh, that has nothing to do with, uh, with how well it works in the ovary. But if there are symptoms that that patients have a hard time tolerating, obviously reducing the dosage is the right thing to do. All right, uh, Claudia, uh, let's see, used to have PCOS when younger. I have a low DHEA and high insulin now that I'm over 40. I am miscarrying even with donor eggs. I have an uh, antiphospholipid antibodies and a partial HLA-DQ uh, with my husband. Will taking DHEA help with carrying a pregnancy? Uh, she's doing donor eggs and maybe you can talk about any other issues that she might find beneficial. It will not help with her immune problem that she obviously has. It will help her not having to use donor eggs. No question about it. Regarding her immune problem, she is a classical patient who needs IVIG on top of standard treatments. And I'm saying that especially since she's she's also matching with her husband, if I understand correctly, in class two HLA, so um, it's two separate problems that need to be tackled together, mm -hmm. uh, and she will be fine. Yeah, and and we're gonna post uh, where you can um, um, find more information about Dr. Gleischer is is a center center for human reproduction. And, and learning even more about uh, DHA and supplements. Uh, let's see, Kayla, PCOS, normal AMH, normal DHA S level, but low on conjugated DHA. Is that something that we should be looking at? Is that? Uh, low on conjugated uh, DHA, uh, I wouldn't put uh, too much uh, emphasis on. Uh, what it tells you is, remember, that DHEAS 
is the only androgen that is practically almost exclusively only produced by the adrenal. And therefore, that counts a lot mm. because that means that your adrenal is not putting out enough DHEA. And uh, even if your, if your AMH seems normal, it may not be normal because you do not know what your AMH was five years ago or 10 years ago when you were young. You may have had high AMH and you may be a PCOS patient, okay? So uh, the HEAS measurements are very important because they tell you something about the pathophysiology. So in, in the evaluation for the patient looking at androgen levels, do you recommend a DHEA, DHEAS, and a testosterone levels? Free testosterone, total testosterone, and sex hormone binding blocker. Okay, okay, all right. And uh, consider testosterone level of 14, 35-year-old female too high. Total testosterone? It just says, yeah, it doesn't say total. It says so. We don't, yeah, we don't I, know I, that. I, I assume it's a total because for a free, it would be exorbitantly high. Yeah. And for a total, it's, it is very low. 14 is a very low. You want at least a 25 uh, for a 35-year-old woman. I would say 35 to uh, 25 to 35. So 14 is very low. Dr. Gleitzer, what's your website that people could find more information about DHEA uh, that you also uh, offer? WW Center for Human Reprod.com. Okay, and we'll we'll put a link to that. And um, and uh, uh, interested parties can see there also our monthly newsletter, which is called the CHR Boys, which is now also available by subscription and printed form, but it is uh, free on our website every month, except in July and August, when we take a break. Okay, we need a break. And how about how about your, your uh, nutraceutical or supplement uh, line? Where can they find more about that? Um, where can they find it? Uh, it's called uh, uh, Fertility Nutraceuticals. Uh, and... Uh, We'll put, a, really, we'll put a link that's on really all I can, That's really all I can tell you. <laughs> that's okay. We'll put a link yeah. to that. And and we're hopefully going to be able to have some other conversations uh, uh, with Dr. Gleischer throughout the year. Is there anything else that maybe you wanted to, to, to mention about uh, DHA in particular or any other topics that you thought were important that uh, we should be mentioning here? There are so many topics to talk in our in, in our specialty these days because there's so much done that that we here at CHR feel is not necessarily in the best interest of fertility patients. Uh, but um, I think uh, androgens are a very important story, and I want to reemphasize that if we do it. Let's do it right. Uh, I think that is very important. And I think we need to, at least those of us who, who feel we understand why androgens are important in, in women, uh, I think we, we have an obligation to educate our colleagues who don't believe it. Um, because as I said, it is those colleagues who in many ways, unintentionally probably, by saying do whatever you want, may make it more difficult for their patients because the patients will, will take their androgen supplements uh, based on what they read somewhere and that is not always correct. It really should come from their doctors. It shouldn't be the patient's decision. And DHEA supplementation should be stopped with an embryo transfer, a UI or pregnancy? No, we, we are stopping uh, with pregnancy. We are okay. stopping with second rising, uh, uh, normally rising H 
CG. And it's not that we are concerned about people taking DHA a few weeks into pregnancy because the placenta is a DHA factor. Yeah. So DHA levels in pregnancy go up uh, significantly. But yeah, we stop it with second rising uh, HCG. Well, I'm really honored, Dr. Gleischer, that you uh, shared these uh, this knowledge with us today. And we look forward to having you on again uh, soon, Dr. Barad. I think we're going to be talking maybe next week. And so we'll put that out so people can uh, sign up uh, to get much more information uh, from you and others like yourself. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity and I'm always available. Okay. And All right. I, God bless. I hope I see you uh, sometime soon again in New York City. I'm going to come down there. I think we uh, have a dinner to do together. Absolutely. All right. Bye, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Bye -bye. I appreciate you. Bye-bye.